Okay, I think we will uh, start. Um, I would like to welcome you all to this seminar on EU's capacity to respond and handle the many crises it is currently facing. My name is Panilla Dikid. I'm a research professor here at NUPI and responsible for our Center for European Research. And I will also inform you to begin with that uh, this seminar, as most of our seminars, will be streamed so that you're aware of that. Before I introduce the key speaker of today, I will just inform you a little bit about the background for this seminar. Uh, this seminar is part of NUPI's seminar series on Europe, which is funded by the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. But it is also closely linked to our research within a large Horizon 2020 project that NUPI and research professor Morten Boers is coordinating called EU UNPAC. The aim of this project is to increase our understanding of EU's capacity or lack of capacity for crisis response. And one of the key findings in this project so far is that while the EU is heavily engaged in crisis response and management and has also a comprehensive approach to crisis throughout the crisis cycle, the main challenge is still that the EU lack, um, uh, uh, is lacking a kind of conflict sensitivity or an in-depth understanding of the real root causes uh, of the conflicts and crisis in which the, um, the EU is engaged. Um, while we in this project mainly look at external crisis, the EU is also facing many internal challenges. And one may ask if there is a similar lack of in-depth understanding or conflict sensitivity also here. More precisely, one may ask whether the EU has adopted the right approach to handle major challenges such as migration, the spread of right-wing populism, terrorism, and uh, the new East-West division, or even Brexit. And if not, what kind of change is needed? So we are very fortunate here today to have Ed Ivan Krastev here to share his views on these important questions. Krastev, who many of you know, is a political scientist from Bulgaria. He is chairman of the Center for Lib Liberal Strategies in Sofia and also permanent fellow at the Institute for Human Science in Vienna. He is also the founding board member of the European Council on Foreign Relations, a member of the Board of Trustees of the International Crisis Group, and is also a regular opinion writer for the New York Times, among other things. Kraste have also written several interesting books and articles on the challenges that modern democracy is facing. And the most recent book, published last year, with a rather provocative title, After Europe, addresses many of the questions I just mentioned. Looking at the title of the book, one gets the impression that um, you argue that Europe and the EU is doomed to fail. Uh, but if I have understood it correctly, it is much more about pointing to the key uh, problems that the EU is currently facing and uh, what it will take to solve them. And if the EU is not able to solve them, then we might see <laughs> the end of Europe. Um, so I really look forward to, or we all do, look forward to uh, listening to you. Uh, you will have about 30 to 40 minutes. And then I will give the floor to my colleague, Morten Boas, who will give a short comment before we open for Q&As. So even Krastev, the floor is yours. Yes. Thank, thank you very much. Thank you for the opportunity. It's my first time in Oslo, so I'm really very much thrilled to be here. Uh, th the book is not as pessimistic as it was told. Uh, and secondly, it's not a book of somebody who does not like European Union. Uh, but it's a very much a book which was coming from a very concrete kind of a experience, in particular as an East European that I, uh, I had. And this was that when I was starting uh, writing the book, European Union was taken for granted. And this is what East Europeans, in a certain way, are not ready to tolerate because uh, we have seen a kind of a political system that, at least in places like Bulgaria, looked quite stable 30 years ago, collapsing overnight. So from this point of view, if Eastern Europe has a certain type of an expertise, it is an expertise on the fragility of everything political. So when in 2009, basically after the financial crisis, then Mr. Barroso was the president of uh, uh, the European Commission, so he started to invite outside experts, talking this and that. And I was one of the invited, and he said, what you can do for us? 
But I said, to be honest, not much, because I'm not specialist on European integration. What I know is how things fall apart. I have been working on the Soviet disintegration. I have been working on the disintegration of Yugoslavia. So I said, but what I can do for you, President, is I can get a first-class historians who know how big political projects disintegrate, and let's see what kind of relevant lessons we can do. And then we really got a first-class specialist on the Habsburg disintegration, the Soviet and the Yugoslavs, I mean Europeans, Americans, uh, Russians, and then we invited five or six of the key person in Brussels, Robert Cooper and others, and said, let's see. Is there, and this is not about elementary comparisons, so we know that neither European Union nor Soviet Union, <laughs> nor Yugoslavia was the Habsburg Empire, but there are three things that stayed with me after this kind of a discussions and in a certain way pushed me to go for the book. The first is that this integration of these big political projects normally is an unintended consequence. It's not that, for example, the anti-EU forces should prevail in order for the disintegration to take place. Secondly, the very definition of disintegration very much depends where you stand. For example, if you talk about Europe on two speed, and if you're talking much more about Europe as consolidation of the Eurozone and keeping the periphery loose, if you're staying in Berlin, this is going to be called further integration. If you're staying in Sofia, this is going to look slightly like disintegration. So even on this, we have, and this was uh, my colleague Jan Zelonka who wrote that we have a thousand theory about European integration. We do not have a theory on European disintegration. We don't know what it means. And thirdly, so my idea was if it is <coughs> this type of uh, unintended consequences very much based on the miscalculation of the different political actors how their kind of acts can affect uh, their politics, what we should be interested for, and how we can prevent uh, certain type of uh, negative developments. And in the book, uh, I, uh, I, I made an, an argument which is not going to strike you as being very original, but my argument was that out of the four crises that basically have been shaping the European Union in the last 10 years, <coughs> starting with the financial crisis, which has a very important impact uh, for changing the economic expectations of the European citizens. Now you have much more people who believe that their kids are going to have a life which is going to be worse than their own, which also very much brought the South-North uh, divide in Europe. And it was very important because it became a kind of the divide between creditors and debtors. And the relations between creditors and debtors are not the relations of equality. And thirdly, what was important was that, uh, paradoxically, the financial crisis put an end to one of the very important legitimation force behind the European projects, namely the convergence power of the European Union. When the poor countries enter the European Union, they're never going to become as rich as the richest, but over time, the distance is kind of uh, <coughs> closing. And this was very much there. It's still true for Eastern Europe, it's not true for some of the South European countries. For example, in Greece, even if their kind of economic reforms program goes well, according to the expectations of uh, uh, the IMF, in 15 years, the difference between uh, the incomes, the average incomes of the Greeks compared with the projected average incomes of the Germans are going to be the same what was the distance between the Greek and West German incomes in the day they entered the European Union. So this is, in my view, this is quite important because it's very much about the very hard legitimacy. The second crisis, of course, was very much about uh, the Ukrainian crisis, Russia's annexation of Crimea, Donbass. And this was critically important because uh, part of the identity of the European Union, and I'm going to touch on this, was based on the fact that in Europe, not in the world, but in Europe, military power doesn't matter anymore. So it's not that Europeans were so naive to believe that it doesn't matter anywhere. But the idea was that in Europe what matters is, is basically economic power and soft power. And then suddenly you realize that probably we managed to convince ourselves that military power doesn't matter because we don't have it. And that at a certain point of view it could be quite important element of all this. Uh, and the third of course came Brexit and Brexit of course was 
very important on many aspects, institutionally, economically. This is one of the biggest European economies getting out, one of the most globally minded, one of the best globally connected. But also the problem of Brexit was very much psychological also. It was unexpected. It was shocking. And secondly, it changed the question. If before Brexit, the questions that all the people were making their PhDs on was who is going to join next the European Union? Then Brexit comes, and the question is who is going to leave next? So suddenly, this integration, which was perceived as inevitable just a day ago, start to be perceived as kind unthinkable, start to be perceived as inevitable, people start to go. On the other side, of course, uh, on a midterm, Brexit very much contributed to the consolidation of the European Union because the way the real life Brexit looks like uh, managed to convince uh, uh, many Europeans that getting out of the European <laughs> Union is not the best that they happen to them. But then comes the migration crisis, and uh, uh, the major argument of my book is that the migration crisis is the only pan-European crisis of all these three, because for the southern countries, the Ukrainian crisis was not a crisis. They didn't understand what we're talking about. For the countries out of the Eurozone, the financial crisis was not so important. Poland never was part of the economic crisis. They didn't have a recession uh, during uh, uh, the financial uh, crisis period. And of course, UK was a crisis, but incidentally, in many of the countries, it was felt very differently. The paradox of the migration crisis was that it was a pan-European crisis, nevertheless, that most of the refugees were well, to a very few number of countries. And secondly, that when you talk about the number of the people that came to Europe, it's not so impressive. If you simply talk numbers, and I'm going to tell you why we should not talk only numbers, but if we talk only numbers, uh, the, the number of people that came as a result of the Middle East crisis, and I'm talking particularly about the refugee crisis, is twice uh, smaller than the number of people who went to Turkey. When then the migration crisis is so important? In my view, this is important because it's transforming the domestic politics of all the countries. And the migration crisis is not about the concrete number of people coming from Syria or uh, Afghanistan. It's all very much about, as a result of the migration of the refugee crisis, uh, and my comparison is that it was Europe's 9-11, it forced Europeans to see the surrounding world with a different eyes. 9-11, from this point of view, was also not what the, matters, the numbers matter. 3,000 people being killed in New York <coughs> is a tragedy, but in terms of numbers, we know much bigger tragedies around the world. But it dramatically changed the way America was seeing the globalization, Americanized world, and others. The same happened in Europe with the refugee crisis. Suddenly, what started to prevail is what I'm going to call the demographic imagination suddenly you look at the world and you start to look at certain projections and statistics which can turn to be wrong, but now for you they're reality. And first you start to understand that you're living in the world in which this is going to be in 50 years the world with not so many Europeans. If in 1950s uh, there were two to three Europeans to every person living in sub-Saharan Africa, according to the projections in the year 2100, there are going to be seven or eight of Africans to every European living in the world. For the general public, this came, came as a shock, because most of the people were living just in their own countries. Secondly, uh, you start to understand that in this world, which is so interconnected, it's also very uneven. And it's not simply that people in Oslo or Vienna are living much better than people in most parts of the world, but for the first time, the people living in some of the small villages in Africa or Asia, they know how people are living in Vienna and Oslo. So in a certain way, if you have a major impact of the globalization, this is that it changed the frame of comparisons. <coughs> If you, before you're comparing yourself with the people next to you, with the country next to you, you suddenly start to compare wi with those who are doing best. And I do believe it's great. It's inspirational on one level. Or it could be also threatening, because what also Europeans recognize is that in this world, which is interconnected and even, and which is very much haunted by global comparisons, if you're living in a small and badly governed place, and if you want to radically change your life in one generation, better change the country than try to change the government. So paradoxically, migration ended up as the 21st century version of the revolution. But for this, you don't need parties, you don't need manifesto, you don't need this and that. Of course, you have a risk taking from some of these places coming to coming to Europe or the United States or Canada. 
is a very kind of a dangerous journey. But this is what you are realizing. And I'm saying this because it was this aspect of migration that explains the fact that nevertheless, that in many of the European Union countries, there are no migrants. There are no refugees, particularly refugees. I'm going to make a, but I'm using this because people like to make this distinction for one reason. Politically, it's good to play it, but when you're seeing from the point of view of the person on the street, basically it's about foreigners whom you don't know, who are coming, and so on. Uh, this became a major issue. Uh, and when I'm saying that some of the countries which are the most negative and hostile to the migrants are the countries which do not have migrants, I'm going to give you some data from Hungary. According to the opinion poll being done in Hungary, there are more Hungarians that claim that they have seen in their life uh, unidentified flying objects than the ones who said that they have personally encountered a refugee. Uh, and I'm going to touch something about the East European kind of dimension of this, but this was basically my major argument, and the, my major argument was that while people are very much focusing on the institutional reforms and what can be done or not done, uh, I do believe that what we see in the last 10 years, for the first time, we see a political crisis. Normally, European Union has been developing as a response to crisis. Uh, particularly Brussels likes to tell you that European Union is a project that has been developing. But if you basically go historically, you're going to see that there were different crises, dif and as a response to different crises, the integration has been progressing. For the first time now, you have converging paths. As a response to all this crisis, we have a much more institutional integration, but at the same time, the political support for it has been dramatically declining, which was not the case before. And here is the second part in which I'll try basically, here is where basically the book stops. And I'll try to make a next step and say, okay, let's try to see if you're trying to go even in a kind of a bigger picture in Europe. What is in fact in crisis? What should be reinvented? And my argument is that European Union and the way we know it today is constituted of three different Europes, which also historically came one after another. The first was the post-war Europe. It was post-1945, and it was very much based in a shared experience of the World War II. And particularly, don't forget, European Union was constituted by the countries that had been in one way or the other defeated in the war. The only European country that ended up as a victor, I mean, on the democratic side, United Kingdom, was not part of the founders. And this type of uh, shared experience of defeat and basically shared experience of kind of strong skepticism to nationalism and the nation state was critically important. But this post-war Europe was also transformed very much as post-war understood as Europe in which the war doesn't matter anymore. And here is the three crises of this first post-war Europe. First, it's the crisis of memory. Basically, you don't have any more the generations that had this as a personal experience. And nevertheless, that in Europe there was a lot of, uh, particularly in Western Europe, Germany and others, uh, a lot of stress to put the education of the younger generations through this type of a war experience. Uh, if you go to the data, and I was uh, seeing some of the data coming from the German schools from five years ago, one third of the students believed that the human rights was equally defended during the Nazi Germany than they are today. It's not anything about nostalgia about Hitler. Simply for them, Hitler is an ancient history. Uh, and one of the interesting impact of the new technologies is that it uh, makes people more and more communicating within their own generations. But you have less and less, in a certain way, talk with the grandparents and others that have lived history. And because basically you don't have it in home any more people that have been alive during these wars and so on and so on, it became slightly abstract. As uh, Tony Judd, uh, uh, the great uh, Anglo-American historian, used to say, we're not learning history anymore. We're just learning the lessons of history. But when you're learning just the lessons of history, you cannot identify it with the people that have been living there, and it becomes difficult. The second thing is, paradoxically, one of the reasons why the, uh, the mm -hmm. World War II memories are fading is based on the fact that our societies are becoming much more diverse. When the Syrian refugees are coming, and we talk about the wars, for them, the war is their war. They have a much stronger sense of the, the destructive nature of the war, but it's not the World War II that they're going to remember. 
Uh, and for these people, basically, it's not easy to connect to this type of a narrative because basically it does not fit to their own experience. And certainly, and I do believe this is going to become more and more a problem, this uh, post-war Europe was very much the Europe I was talking about that managed to convince itself that the military power doesn't matter. This was particularly strong, of course, in Germany, if you're going to see what happened to the military budgets and so on. Even two, three years ago, in all other parts of the world, the military budgets were going up. Only Europeans basically was declining their military budgets, believing that it's not about us. And there was this beautiful book where all these uh, soldiers has gone. Uh, and you can see that we're not talking simply about financial politics. There is a major pacification of the European mind, which is a cultural issue. So it's not enough to say we're going to invest much more. Because basically the success of the European project was to make Europeans not interested in a war. War is not our game. And this is starting to change. Of course, I do believe that Ukraine came as a major shock, but it was much more shock to the policy elites than to the publics. In the publics, you don't have this major idea that the world is changing in a different way. And it's different from country to country. And, uh, but I do believe, particularly in Germany, uh, uh, I don't believe that they still have the feeling that the world has very much been transformed on this, uh, on this level. And the next thing that is happening, but I do believe it's going to escalate much more, is that post-war Europe is now in crisis because this type of post-1945 Europe was an America's Europe. And the relations between the United States and the European Union has changed dramatically, and they should not be blamed simply on President Trump. President Trump is who he is, uh, and it's easy to talk about him, but at the end of the day, I do believe it started much earlier, and this is there are much important structural reasons behind it. Simply under the Trump administration, it took this type of a cartoon form, which makes it very more visible. But I do believe that it is changing because, and I'm coming from Washington, I was for the last three months uh, uh, in, the, uh, in, in Washington, and this is an amazing to see. In Washington, every talk is China. You have the feeling, the atmosphere very much of, on the base of what I have been reading historically, this is like, United States 1949 Truman moment. Suddenly you have the emerging consensus on both sides, Republicans and the Democrats. China is the biggest rival. Everything is going to be decided in the next 10 years. It's going to be US versus China. And you have uh, China becoming the major organizing principle of the American foreign policy. Nevertheless, of what they're talking about, China is at the back of their mind. And if you come to Europe, this is not the way China. There may be people who are unhappy with China for different concrete reasons, technology steps, and so on. Uh, but Europe does not have the feeling, basically, that uh, it is defined by the relations to China. Uh, while for the, uh, for the Americans, China and Russia now are going together. And I do believe the Trump administration lost the hope that they can split the two of them. Uh, but even this, uh, even people who, for example, could be very much antagonized by Russia and afraid of Russia, they're not going to put China and Russia together. Even in some of the East European countries, you're going to believe that China could be kind of a balancing with respect to Russia. I'm saying this because this is also going to be part of this post-war Europe in which Europe is trying to get a kind of a security outlook of its own, which was not the case before. The second Europe that constituted current European Union is the post-1968 Europe of Rights. And it was very much based on the experience of a generation that uh, there was, uh, Simon Moran has this beautiful book called The Last Utopia about human rights. And this is when these projects of the future world went into crisis, particularly after 1968 uh, 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 on the left, but it was very much uh, uh, with the after Soviet invasion if in, in Czechoslovakia, but also what happened in China and so on. So the human rights became kind of an identity of a very important generation in European politics. And when we talk about human rights, it was the rights of the individuals, but it was particularly the minority rights. So when we talk about rights, we talk about minority rights. And when we talk identity politics, we talk about minority politics. This was not the case in Eastern Europe, and I'm going to touch on this. But for the Western Europe, this was the second Europe of rights. And on this second Europe, we also had a major transformation. And this major transformation is seen with the rise of the new conservative populist parties all over. And of course, these parties are very different. Uh, uh, but there is one thing that is common for all this trend. They speak also rights, but this time it's the rights of majorities. <laughs> 
they're talking identity politics, but this politics is the politics of the majority. And the major question which they ask is, the majority in a democracy have the right to decide who is going to belong to their political community and what, the, what kind of conditions. So this is very much about citizen rights and basically integration and so on. And of course, we can discuss much more where it comes from, but it's a major change and you can see it all over the political spectrum. It's not something happening in one country and so on. Uh, and this type of uh, Europe also has not found itself. And uh, my argument was always that it really should be seen what we're seeing with some of these populist parties, very much in comparison with a certain mood on the left, which we basically experience, or Europe experienced Western Europe after 68 and the beginning of the 1970s. The success of the European democracies then was that European center right managed to integrate part of what then was far left, the European center left, far left, and basically to make some of these players the mainstream parties. Uh, we have been talking with Joschka Fischer recently, and listen, in the 1970s, some of these far left political figures were perceived as a major threat to the political system. They were on the streets, they were talking violence, uh, they were very anti-capitalist. Uh, there was a very strong attack also on uh, uh, basically NATO and so on. But over time you have a period of de-radicalization and in a certain way you manage to split the really radical groups, Red Army faction in Germany on one side, and certain groups which basically try to understand that if they want to be part of this game they should respect the rules of the democratic game and it's not simply going on the elections but it's also rule of law and kind of the liberal frame. Is the center right be able to do this with the far right today? It's a big question. It's a big question. Uh, and, uh, but in a certain way, it is a kind of a much more move which is part of a change of a cultural hegemony on many of the rights. It's not simply basically about one political party changing another in government. And the third Europe that constituted the European Union that you have today is for sure the Europe of post-1989. This was the United Europe that also included the Eastern Europe. It was a big change. A lot of new countries come. It was perceived as a huge success. It has an important economic uh, uh, effect, positive, most of them. There were also some negative, but this is also a different Europe when it comes to how you're governing it because of the size, because of everything. And of course, we see also the crisis of this United Europe, and of course, Mr. Orban and Mr. Kaczynski are the faces of this, but it's a much bigger crisis. And what I'm going to argue is that in order to understand what is happening in Central and Eastern Europe, uh, there are four facts, and two are in the book, and two I'll try to add that, at least for me, are quite important to keep in your mind. One is that if you look at the ethnic maps of Europe in the beginning of 20th century, you're going to see two Europes. One was quite ethnically homogeneous, and it was Western Europe. And the other was quite culturally and ethnically diverse, and this was Central and Eastern Europe. It was the Habsburg lands, Poland, Czech Republic, Hungary. Then came, for these countries, the interwar period was perceived as a period of trouble, and the minorities in many of the countries, particularly German minorities, were perceived as the security minorities, uh, very much creating problem for the territorial disintegration of the country. Poland, the Czech Republic. As a result of the World War II, what we had in Central and Eastern Europe was a major ethnic cleansing that ended up with extremely homogeneous ethnic populations. In 1939, one third of the population of Poland were not Poles. There were Germans, there were Jews, there were Ukrainians. At present, more than 95% of the population of Poland are Poles. And this is true for Hungary and this is true for the Czech Republic. At the same time, just the opposite was happening in uh, Western Europe, where as a result of decolonization and basically migration, societies that could have been quite ethnically uh, homogeneous started to diversify. Let's give you the comparison between two countries staying next to each other with a very similar histories, Hungary and Poland today, uh, Hungary and uh, Austria today. In Hungary, 4% of the population, around 4% of the population of Hungary today, uh, citizens of Hungary are not born in Hungary. And most of them are Hungarians born in Romania or in Serbia. In Austria, 14% of the citizens of Austria today are not born in Austria. This is percent higher than the American citizens not born in the United States. Around 50% of the kids in the Vienna schools do not have German as a first language. This is a major change. 1968 was the other kind of a major dividing line. 
There was 1968 in the East, there was 1968 on the West. In the West, it was very much about individual rights. It was basically about minority rights. In uh, Central and Eastern Europe, it was about the right of the nation. It was about sovereignty. When the Polish students went on the street in 1968, they had been singing patriotic songs because it was about the Soviets and about the sovereignty of their states and the Czech Republic, Czechoslovakia then was an obvious case about this. I'm saying this because these cultural differences were very strengthened by a one part of the migration story that is basically under-discussed. And this is that as a result of the opening of the European borders after 1989 and our country is joining the European Union, you see a major process of depopulation of Central and Eastern Europe. I'm going to give you some figures, and for those of you who don't know them, it's going to be quite shocking. Compared with 1989, Baltic republics lost basically one third of their population. You have the combination of aging people and people who moved to live and work in the West. Bulgaria basically, in, uh, after 1989, lost 20% of its population, and the projection is that they're going to lose 21% more in the coming 30 years. We are talking everywhere about very small nations. In Romania, which is a country of 20, 21 million, for the last 10 years, 3.4 million people left the country to work uh, and live abroad, and out of them, three-fourths are on the age under 35. <coughs> Depopulation, when East Europeans stock migration, the biggest <coughs> concern is not about foreigners coming, because there are not many foreigners running to our country at the moment. I never saw basically a Syrian dreaming to live in Romania or Bulgaria. <coughs> but it is about the trauma of the people living. Because people who left, they're hurting their countries in three important ways. First, economically, it's not simply that you're losing labor, and in the beginning it was positive because there was high unemployment, people are coming to Norway, they're working, their remittance is money, so it was positive. And from the point of view of the individuals, it is still positive. But the problem is that people who are living, all the money that state has invested in their education go with them. So paradoxically, if you're going to start to calculate the money had been leaving Eastern Europe as the investment that had been done in the education of these people, you're going to see a huge amount of money. And in certain parts of the public services particularly, it is dramatic. I'm always joking that it's much easier to find in Eastern Europe non-corrupt politician than to find a nurse because the nurses are totally out, they're very badly paid in our countries. On the other side, there is a huge demand for people taking care of all the people in much richer countries. So all the people that have these skills are living, you can imagine what is happening to the health system as a result of it. But also it's psychological. And psychologically, this is quite important because even if your life has changed, and in many of our countries, the change is very positive if you basically go Bulgaria, but particularly if you go to a place like Poland, this is a different country. And this is different in a very positive way. So you can, and even Poles are going to recognize it, 80% of them are quite satisfied with their life. But when you are living in this country and you know that many of your friends wants to leave the country, the idea of the success is not the same. It's not the same to be successful in a country which everybody wants to come to <coughs> and in a country from which many wants to leave. The strange and third political effect of all this is, and this is part of the paradox of 1989, after every revolution, somebody is leaving the country. But normally, this is the defeated party. This was the white Russians that lived after the Bolshevik revolutions, and it was white French after the French Revolution. Uh, in Eastern Europe, the first to leave was the liberal East Europeans, because every revolutionary wants to live in the future, and if you believe that the future of Poland is Germany, better to go directly to Germany than to wait basically your country to become like Germany. So as a result of it, you have uh, a very a lot of young people living. As a result of it, the young people are becoming a small generational cohort and their vote does not matter so much on the elections. And this explains very much the fact why you're going to read a lot of story about young Romanians or Bulgarians protesting on the streets, but you're not going to see their choices very much being represented in the government or in the parliament. They don't have the numbers. They don't have the numbers. <coughs> 
Uh, so I'm saying this, and there is uh, my last point is the other thing that happened in Central and Eastern Europe was that after 1989, there was something that uh, I'm calling the imitation imperative. The idea was that with the end of the ideological confrontation, what uh, the world, and particularly post-communist countries, are going to do is imitate the West, institutions, norms, ways of life. And this was very much also the choice of our countries themselves. But after a long period of imitations, something important is happening. The relations between the model and the imitator are asymmetrical relations. You're all the time judged by somebody else. Your success, your failure. And this rejection of the imitation is becoming the major battle cry of all of the populist parties. As one of uh, the major intellectual supporters of Mr. Orban used to say, we don't want to imitate the Germans anymore. We don't want to imitate the French. We want to be our own. Uh, so this kind of a rejection of the imitation as the way of politics is behind much of uh, the, uh, the support for the populist parties which we see. So I'm going to end up here because in my view, European Union, in order to get out of this crisis, is not simply basically trying to do slightly better on the economy or try to have institutional form here and there. It should try to deal with all these three Europes that we are talking about. It should try to reinvent itself as a post-war project, but post-war project in the world in which the military threats are much more back and very different than they have been before. Uh, it is going to basically try to redefine itself with a kind of a cultural tide that is basically very much moving towards majority rights and how this is going to be reconciled with the idea of the post-national European Union. And for sure, this is going to try to deal with the discrepancies between East and West, because I'm, uh, I'm planning to do it. I still have not do it technically, but my major argument is that the difference within the European Union when it comes to certain type of liberal values and others between Eastern Europe and Western Europe are going to be very much similar to the difference between the red states and the blue states in the U United States. And they're going to be very much also being explained by the same phenomena, depopulation in the red states, much more diverse and kind of economically dynam dynamism in the, in the blue states and now because of President Trump, at least these studies in the United States are flourishing. Uh, so I, I'm going, to, I'm going to, uh, to stop here, and I'm very much kind of uh, really interested in the discussion because Norway, at least in my totally illiterate view, uh, you have a kind of a very particular point of view. We have been talking, you're both inside and outside. So you try, you have this perspective of somebody who really knows how it is, because in the everyday politics, Norway is very much part of it. On the other side, you don't need to share the hysteria uh, of many of our countries being inside and trying to do and so on and so on. So from this point of view, thank you very much for the invitation and for the opportunity to present. Thank you. Okay, thank you so much uh, for a very interesting presentation. I just give the floor to, uh, to Morten Bøs, who will have a comment, and then we, we start a discussion after that. Thank you, Pernille, and thank you, Ivan. Uh, this was a wonderful presentation, and I mean, uh, I... Uh, listened to you at the SEPS uh, IDs lab uh, earlier this year, and I immediately thought that this is a man we need to get to Oslo and Nupi. So I'm very glad that we were able to do this uh, today and that you could uh, come. Um, hard act to follow, and I'm not going to try to sort of uh, touch on too many things, but uh, just a few points from my perspective, which is not the perspective of a scholar that uh, deals with the European Union or Europe per se, but uh, a scholar that has spent at least some time over the last two, three years trying to understand what, the, what Europe is trying to do elsewhere in the world, both in the Balkans and elsewhere. And I may also touch upon some of your thing, the, or, or some of the other points that you, that you have, but uh, I'll be brief. Uh, so, I think that, I mean, sort of a major question here is sort of what is bringing Europe and the EU to, if not the brink, at least to a crucial moment in time, because I don't think we are at the brink yet, but uh, Europe is at a crucial moment in time. Where EU and the Europe basically needs to show, I think, that it's fit for the future. And I'm not certain that 
Europe passed that test in 2014, 2015. It failed that test, basically. That doesn't mean that it's uh, failed forever, but it needs to find a way of dealing with this. I just returned uh, <laughs> to our airport half an hour before you, um, not from somewhere, uh, not from Vienna, but from, uh, from the Sahel. And having returned right now from Niger and the Sahel, where a new European border is at attempted, implemented, it's tempting to point to migration and refugee management, and particularly sort of the management of the, of the migration crisis. And here I think that Europe needs to come up with a better alternative also of how to separate these two crises, because right now they are meshed together, and that is not the solution to this. And, if the, and the only sort of power left that can deal with this is Europe, because Europe has to deal with it, because nobody else go is going to deal with it. And I, is that possible? It is at least very clear from where I work that the idealism of 68 and maybe also 1989 that gave rise to this idea about the EU as some sort of global normative power, a kind of new global actor, is if not dead, at least seriously undermined. Because what we are doing in places like Niger and the Sahel has nothing to do with being a normative power at all, pushing through unconstitutional new laws in Niger, for example. This is not what I think they meant when they started talking about this as a normative power. So in this regard, I very much share your claim that EU's and Europe's current failures is of a different kind than the ones of the past. that came to constitute building blocks for re recreation and innovation. The question is if, can we learn from this? Can Europe learn from, for example, 2014, 2015, so that also these failures can become, yet one more time, a basis not for repeating failures, but for some sort of new innovation? Is there, an, uh, is there any way that we can see some European consensus on these major, major issues? Or are we, to take your point of view about how we have forgotten the past, are we again, is again this, uh, the reference point 1914, not in the case of an all-out European war, but that we as sleepwalkers is just taking things for granted without seeing that the current European project is also heading towards a possible disaster in the future because we are, we, are taking, we are still taking it for granted, and we probably no longer can take what we have taken for granted for granted, to put it that way. And I'm not really certain that that wake-up call has really hit Brussels, to put it mildly. It's still sort of taken for granted that this, that this cannot change, this cannot fail, that it just will continue, and I think that's quite dangerous. You talked about a Europe from integration to, uh, to exclusion. But maybe you also need to t t talk about a process that has been sort of running much more rapidly and it was sort of spurred by the migration refugee crisis of 2014-2015. But it's been laying there for quite a while, a process of fragmentation but also polarization, both between countries but very much so also within countries, and perhaps most no more notable in Western Europe than in Eastern Europe, this po polarization and fragmentation within. Uh, really a polarization and fragmentation of the European polity, if you could talk about so, uh, such. And I mean, you talked about the, the center right and its ability or not to do what the uh, center left did earlier, and that is to find a way of integrating the new right or the far right or whatever we should call it. I'm not so certain that any of those terms are really adequate for this uh, new phenomenon. But here I would like to also to ask you, what about the European left? What role can they play in this? Because, I mean, as I see it, I mean, the European left has basically, in many ways, abandoned what is left of the European working class. And, and looking with a, quite a lot of contempt 
for what is emerging underneath what is left of the European working class. And, and that is what I would call the European increasing European lumpen proletariat, within, which in many ways are also at least parts of this new right. Is, the, is there a role here? Can the European left, center left, can it reimagine itself? Can it recreate itself? Can it once more become a driving force here? Can it once more be able to integrate those groups of society that it was initially built on, which it knows in many ways has abandoned? <coughs> so I was wondering how this sits also, Ivan, with your interest in conceptualization of what you call threatened majorities. So I very, would very much like to have your point about this. Uh, it would also be interesting to hear you talk, uh, I'm, I'm soon done, uh, hear you talking a little bit more about going a little bit, uh, drilling a little di deeper in what is happening in Eastern uh, and, and Central Europe and uh, sort of the long, very long-term consequences of this outbound uh, migration and how in many ways, I mean, it's sort of, must be in many ways also changing the very composition of the pol of, of these polities, but also the relationship between how we, what we may call the original or sort of still homebound Central European polities, and, for lack of a better word, uh, word I mean the diaspora polities. Are, the, are we here? Can we here, in the terms of Andersons, uh, talk about uh, uh, an imagined community, or is that bound? Um, is that bond simply been broken? I don't know. Maybe you have an answer to it. And finally, and this is my last point, I mean, the imitation imper imperative. How can we go, uh, go uh, get around it? Is it possible, or can a more flexible, pragmatic union even be imagined when the idea of the EU as this normative power, in my point of view, is dead? What this means to me is that the EU need to try to come up with, it, it needs a new all-European ID that can integrate. But how can that be imagined? And can it even be imagined in this point in time? Particularly in a point in time, and I'll end with this, as that may sound provocative to some, is that can it be imagined in a time when we are so busy building dams in the Sahel that on the contrary to Trump, Europe is, in fact, building several walls. We are just not talking about it. Thank you. Thank Very you. Much. Thank you, Morten. And you can maybe start uh, responding yeah, yeah, to, exactly. to Morten's question, yeah. and then you can sign yeah. up uh, for I'll questions. I'll take three. Thank you very much. And it was very interesting. And uh, uh, I'm very much on your side. Just talking about starting with the walls, there was a study being done. There were 16 walls that existed in the world in 1989. Now every third country in the world is building one type of wall or another. So uh, one historian was calling the last 30 years the interwall period. Uh, uh, but uh, but uh, I'll make three points. The first is that the end of history was an American idea, but it was a kind of a German reality. And I was talking, and this is Thomas Bagger, the, uh, the current foreign policy advisor to president, uh, 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 the German president and long uh, years head of the German policy planning. Uh, he was always said this was the best part for us because Germany was on the right side. Uh, Germany does not need the leadership because history is following a direction and we don't have a problem to translating the world leader in German. Uh, and certainly kind of everything was just managing the floor of the historical events. And I'm saying this because of course Brussels is an important story, but intellectually the biggest problem is going to be Berlin. And uh, the biggest problem is because unlike other countries, uh, Germany was not... Uh, uh, touched by the financial crisis directly. It was very much shattered by the refugee crisis. And of course, the Ukrainian crisis made it see differently the world, but much more on the level of the elite than on the level of the public. And then we'll go to the left, right. If you are, I'm now staying in Austria. More than 80% of the working class vote goes for the far right. If you're talking about the labor parties, workers' parties, and far right, you're right, COVID, 
on the right of the center right. I don't don't get it in a value statement because they're very different parties. I don't like labeling uh, uh, people. Uh, the fact that you're not going to vote for them does not mean that basically you should try to. But this is they're getting. Uh, uh, they have the vote of the workers. And uh, one thing that happened was basically the collapse of the classical Marxist left is that if there is no the perspective of the world that is going to be run by the workers, give me one reason why the workers should be supportive of globalization. This idea of having a working class which was for their rights but also for internationalists was very much part of a classical historical period and a very powerful kind of a frame of the Marxism which was saying to the workers, you need other workers because this is how we are going to win. Uh, if you're not going this, it's quite normal that this type of a voters are going to be for economic protectionism but also for cultural protectionism. Uh, in a certain way, what was there before was exceptional, not what you're seeing now. Uh, and from this point of view also, I do believe we see a major reorganization of the left-right, which is not so much based on the economic issues. And this is the interesting story about European integration. If you go with the European Union before 1989, you're going to see that foreign policy was very much out of the electoral politics. Because of the Cold War, uh, basically uh, Chancellor Schmidt famously said our relations with the United States are too important to be left to the people. Uh, so the foreign policy decisions were taken out, but economic decisions were very much at the core of the electoral politics. Now in the European Union, in the Eurozone, all major macroeconomic decisions are taken out of the electoral politics. We have constitutionalized the budget deficits in the way we have constitutionalized human rights. So from this point of view, when economic differences are not at the center, of electoral politics, identity <coughs> politics come normally at the center. And paradoxically, part of the rise of the identity politics is also the fact that economic differences have been very much narrowed as a, in order for the Eurozone to exist. And then you're going to see a kind of a different left which is uh, emerging. This different left is much more based on a post-material, much highly educated part of society. So German Greens, this is not a working class vote. In a certain way, they're as far from the working class as the liberals are. So in a certain way, this is a kind of a post-material <coughs> left, which is much more humanitarian, which is interested in rights, which is, but in a certain way, this is a different left. And also what you're seeing on the conservative side is also center-right, which was very much based on kind of economic issues and others, are very much being basically replaced by conservative groups, which are much more traditionalist. Some of them could be very much reactionary. And here we're coming to the problem of central and Eastern Europe and the imitation. Uh, my the image that, because I just finished a book on imitation, and this is, but the image with which it started is 1989, the world was, was a stage which was prepared on to set up the performance of George Bernard Shaw's uh, Pygmalion. I don't remember, do you remember the play? But it's a play about a very poor flower girl that was taken by a professor in phonetics and over a very short period of time, she starts speaking like the queen and wanted to be treated by the queen. And then you go with this and you watch and watch and then finally realize that in fact you're not watching Pygmalion, you're watching Frankenstein. In a certain way, the idea to create a replica of yourself, you have created the political regimes that out of a different kind of elements of liberal democracy created a liberal monster. And in a certain way, this is particularly true in the case of Hungary where you basically, because of a constitutional majority, Mr. Orban, who unfortunately is a very gifted politician, he created a media law, which is very restrictive. You don't want to be a journalist under this law. But every article of it has a precedent in the media law of some <laughs> other European Union country. So in a certain way, you're taking and you're assem assembling a kind of a illiberal democracy in which basically the majority runs and you have elections and theoretically everything is fine. The only thing which is not fine is that it's going to be very difficult to change those in government. Uh, and I'm saying all this because this is something that is happening. On the other side, Central and Eastern Europe is not the same place because they are small countries. Nobody has the patience to look to all of them if you're not living there. People try to believe that there is one trend everywhere. It is not. And uh, here's my favorite Swiss joke. 
And because there are not many Swiss jokes, I want to <laughs> tell it as a kind of a methodological introduction. And this is a, a joke about a eight, nine years old German boy, French boy, and Swiss boy discussing where the babies come from. And the German boy said they're coming from the sky, and the parents find them in front of the door, and the French boy start laughing. He said, this is ridiculous. Of course, they come from the bedroom. And then suddenly, the Swiss boy became very nervous. And he said, do not generalize. It's different from Canton to Canton. <laughs> uh, uh, <laughs> and in a way, it is different from Canton to Canton. Poland, where Mr. Kaczynski, by the way, between people normally put Hungary and Poland together. Uh, there is a lot of shared views of the world. It's very much sovereignist regimes. They're very much culturally conservative, but they're very different. Uh, Mr. Orban is not famous for being not interested in money. Mr. Kuczynski is not interested in money. Polish regime is reactionary. It's not corrupt. They have, for them, in a certain way, cultural issues are the central issues. It's about sovereignty. In a certain way, this is a 19th century ideology <coughs> for Mr. Kaczynski <laughs> with a 20th century political militancy in the 21st century, but this is a different story. And also it's a very divided country, and as you see on the local elections, uh, Poland very much resembles the United States. They're simply two Polands, and they're trying to basically negotiate between each other how it's going to be. So I'll not be surprised at all uh, if the opposition is going to prevail on the European elections or uh, on the next elections. And nevertheless, that this type of Poland is not going to be liberal in the way Germany is. This is much more liberal than what you expect from Central and Eastern Europe. So there is a Tusk Poland and there is uh, Kaczynski Poland. And I'm saying this because you see all these countries being strongly anti-refugees and others. At the moment, there are almost 2 million foreigners working in Poland. 1.5 of them are Ukrainians. But they start also to import Filipinos because of being Catholic. Uh, 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 but also people from other places. So strangely enough, and this is about normative power, European Union and most of our governments said we are open to the refugees because these are people in need and this is what we have a moral obligations, but we don't want illegal migrants. The reality is just the opposite. We are open to migrants because migrants you can select whom you need, basically it's based on economic interests, you want to cap them or not, you don't feel moral obligations towards them. We have a problem with refugees because basically you cannot say no. You cannot select if you're going to follow your own principles. Uh, and from this point of view, in Central and Eastern Europe, you have much more migrants, but when it comes basically to people that you don't want for economic or other reasons, this is where the problem comes. And of course, Islam is a major issue for, for different reasons to countries. And one of them is diaspora. People are normally going to say, why Poland is so negative on Islam, unlike Bulgaria and others, it was never part of the Ottoman Empire. And don't forget, Ottoman Empire was one of the very few places in the world that never recognized the partition of Poland. Almost for two centuries, on the every ceremony in the Sultan's uh, a court, they are going to announce the ambassador of Poland. And then they're going to say absent. So from this point of view, there was a quite strong kind of a link. The problem is that many Poles working in London are working in areas in which they compete for jobs or basically uh, share neighborhood uh, with people coming from the Muslim countries. And part of this anti-Islamic sentiment, paradoxically, is coming from the diaspora through the social media. Uh, and I'm going to this because I'm going to, uh, to end up on, uh, on your uh, talk about, for me, uh, the, the threat of majority is the most important element for understanding what is going on. You have a majority groups, most of them ethnic groups, which starts to believe that when they see the demographic projections, they're not going to be majorities in 20 years, 30 years, 35 years. And then the problem is what you're doing with the democratic institutions. And the same institutions that have been perceived very much as the institutions to include others, they also can play the role for excluding others. And how you're going to regulate this process, it's extremely interesting. I am very much uh, started a project of my own trying to see how the major inflow of foreigners which are coming and which are perceived to be ready to vote and block is changing the democratic institutions. For example, this happened in the United States after the Civil War when the blacks get the right to vote in the South and states. What was the response? 
the response was basically a regime and constitutional engineering that trying to reduce their power in the political system. And you ended up with a kind of a one-party regimes uh, in the South. This is how Israel was transformed after the Soviet Jews uh, came in a big number. So I'm much more interested is Germany, to the West Germany. And the most important is, do you believe <coughs> that the newcomers are voting for different parties? Or they have a very strong bias to one of the parties? Because then basically this demographic projection start very much to shape the way you are trying to play politics with institutions, with media, with everything. So from this point of view, the threat majorities are majority groups that basically develop the sensitivities of persecuted minority because in a certain way they start to fear the future. And I want to stop on this. What has dramatically changed in Europe for the last 10 years is our relations to the future. 10 years ago, we have been convinced that we're the laboratory of the future and the world is becoming more, much more like us. And we have a good reasons to believe it. Then suddenly we look at ourselves and we discover that we're very exceptional. And how to have a normative politics from the point of view of being exceptional is something that I find a really interesting and challenging question. Okay, I have a few questions. Let me yeah, just, yeah, <coughs> let me just uh, ask you one question before I open yeah. for the floor. Because you are pointing to the, the, the how national politics should change in order to kind of take your answer to these problems. But I wonder, uh, to, to what extent can the EU as such, as an institution, what can, can the EU do in order to, uh, to address some of these, uh, these challenges? Uh, because as I see it from, uh, if you see the development from 2003 to now, you see a change in the European Union's approach as a reaction to these different crises, as you mentioned. And there is some kind of wake-up call. And the program that uh, Emmanuel Macron is kind of um, presenting is very much to take some of these concerns seriously to create a, a Europe, uh, an Europe qui protège, more kind of addressing the, the, the concerns of the people. So I just wonder if you could say a few words about that before. Uh, very much, and thank you for that. I'm going to say something which is very much politically non correct about. I do believe that, I do believe Macron absolutely rightly got where is the problem and the idea of the sovereignty of the European Union is a huge issue. But here's the problem, and I do believe that for these European elections, Macron can become one of the most vulnerable parts of the pro-European progressive core. Why? Not simply because of uh, the problems that he faces in France, and if you're going to basically read the opinion polls, for the moment, Marie Le Pen is performing better than him. Just imagine symbolically what is going to mean if Le Pen is going to get more than Macron's party on the European election in France. But because, paradoxically, in the French imagination, uh, when they talk about the European Union sovereignty, they really mean Western Europe. And this is a major difference the way the Germany and France perceive the world. For Macron, Eastern Europe is simply not there. It's not that he's against Eastern Europe. It's not on this level. He simply basically tried to reconsolidate Europe in the way it was before 1989. It's very difficult to do it institutionally. It's not, is it right or wrong? It's not because I missed European or not, but European Union is done in the way that all these group of small countries can block basically everything if they feel excluded. And before, vetoing was perceived as the veto option in the EU. Now it's a conventional weapon. Now we are going to have a government which are going much more ready to do this. So from this point of view, I do believe that the major struggle for the European Union in the next two or three years is going to be on the level of the national politics. For sure in the biggest states, and here Germany and France are critical, there is an interesting how the North, Sweden and others are going to play their game. And of course, Italy is at the heart of everything because the biggest problem for Macron is even if you believe that Europe is the Eurozone and you can really cut the Poles and the Hungarians who create a problem, you cannot cut Italy. And Italy, for very particular reasons, has in itself concentrated both the problems of the East and the West. When it comes to immigration, this is a place in which quite a lot of foreigners, refugees, and migrant camps. At the same time, almost one million people has left Italy, like East European countries, to go to work in other places. This is a place with 10 years without economic growth, and you have an aging population. So without basically solving the Italian crisis, the European Union neither can consolidate on the level of 
Eurozone, no basically can become much more functional on the idea of the European Union itself. And from this point of view, where I have a huge sympathy with Macron is he understands better the power of the symbolic politics. Europe cannot be discussed only on the level of interests. It should be perceived as a community of faith. Europeans should have the feeling that if they're going to lose, they're going to lose together. And uh, this is the positive on my side. I do believe there is one good s story of all this crisis. Suddenly, we Europeans started to be interested in each other. Before, the Germans didn't care about the Greek economy. Now they became experts on Greek economy. And Poles and Hungarians know about the German as asylum-seeking legislation more than they know about their own. So this type of a mutual self-interest, in my view, is quite important. But paradoxically, Europe cannot agree on a common enemy. Uh, and also the redistrib kind of redistribution of power of the world is also changing. Uh, the relations with Russia is changing. By the way, one of the interesting impact of Trump that very few people talk about is that Trump succeeded to shift the loyalty of the far right from Russia to the United States. This is the Bannon effect. If you're going to see all these parties, which two years ago was simply going to be perceived as just working very much with the Russians, now we're going to see all the Salvinis, but including Corbans of this world, trying much more to side with Trump. So this is also one of the interesting stories that these European elections are going to be extremely important because at the end of the day, it's not simply which, how many votes certain parties are going to end up, what kind of consensuses are going to come up what kind of coalitions you're going to end up with. And from this point of view, they're going to be the first European elections that matter for Europe. None of the previous one has any impact. So this is why I still believe that national politics is critically important. Thank you. Uh, Ulf? <coughs> <coughs> Thank you so much, Ivan. This was very interesting. I have, uh, if you, I have three small uh, questions, if I can find them on my phone here, took my notes. Um, you talked a lot about demographics, uh, and I think it's very important what you said about it, the aging societies. Uh, and this is obviously east-west dimension to it, uh, but it's also a rural-urban dimension, and uh, maybe also a gender dimension, and certainly age dimension okay. as well. Now, um, I'm, I'm just curious, if you look at the election, uh, research on elections, you see that uh, elderly voters, they don't necessarily vote only for their own self-interest. They vote uh, on with the regard to their children or grandchildren, or and and uh, so uh, and uh, you so you somehow you make the assumption that all the voters only vote for the past somehow, but uh, maybe they vote also for the future. So I'm just curious about uh, your thinking on that. Uh, the second point, and uh, and uh, you you have a lot of pessimistic. Uh, you you can you paint a bit of a doom, uh, doomsday picture, but at the, the same Bulgarian time, you characters. yeah, but you also present, I think, a fairly obvious solution. Yep. Yeah. Because as I said, uh, in the West, uh, migration from East creates a bit of tensions in welfare states, whereas in the East, you have a drain of talent, etc. And the obviously uh, point then is to renegotiate the mobility of workers. Um, and uh, there's been some attempts at doing that. Uh, Cameron even tried to do that. Uh, and, uh, and there's been discussion also proposed uh, on related to m uh, posting workers, etc., by Macron. So why are some of the East and Central European governments so opposed to renegotiating a bit of the... Uh, if th this is such a cost to their society? And, uh, but could there be a way of renegotiating some of these aspects in order to ease uh, some of these tensions. So that's a bit of uh, one at least very positive thing that comes out of your speech. And then the th uh, third point, and that relates to your approach today that I think is really important, the identity-based approach. Uh, but uh, if you look a bit at the uh, institutional aspect, uh, Fritz Scharf, the political scientist, he's talked about the decision trap of the EU. So b basically saying that, he said that for 20 years, that the EU is caught in a trap. On the one hand, the EU level is don't have the competence, legal competence, to exercise authority in a lot of areas. But at the same time, national governments want to maintain national sovereignty. 
And this has created a very unstable situation where the EU level is incapable of acting. At the same time, the national government are impotent. And uh, there are basically two solutions to this. Uh, to either move towards more competence or decision-making authority at the European level, or to delegate competence back to the national level. Uh, and uh, uh, but you didn't touch much on on the kind of the institutional architecture responding to the crisis. But if if, if you could say something about that, that would be great. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I'll try. I'll start with the last one first. I didn't touch because also I feel myself less competent to say something interesting about this. But I always very much agree with Sharp on this. You have in a certain way in Brussels policies without politics, and in many of the national states politics without policies particularly in the small nation states. And this created basically frustration on both sides. Uh, Brussels' frustration is that they see that something which is absolutely irrational, for example, redistributing refugees, cannot happen. And they said, where is the problem? And to be honest, they're right. Where is the problem? 1,600 people to go to Hungary. <laughs> but because in the country, the fear of the voter is that in the European Union you can change governments but you cannot change policies. This is why the national government started to build on the symbolic politics. We are going to stop a ship. We are going to basically refuse this or that just to show that we have sovereignty. So in a certain way, it's not simply a decision-making trap, but this decision-making trap basically is creating the identity of both sides. Brussels starting to claim that our <coughs> all our legitimacy comes from the fact that we are the only rational people in this madhouse. And then basically comes the governments who said, we're the only one who care for you. All others, basically, they don't have a relations to you as the voters. And then goes to uh, your great questions about uh, uh, the, the how the freedom of movement is done. This is the real paradox. And this has something to do with the way movement from the rural areas, basically urbanization, take place during the communist period. It was very much a forced industrialization and forced urbanization. This most of the society with the respect, with the, by the way, with big exception of the Czech Republic, which is also the country that has the least out migration, was done for a very short period of time. It was not simply basically done through changing of uh, nationalization of land and things like this, but also through a very strong ideology that the very movement from the village to the city is a social promotion. To be the worker is much more important than to be a peasant. And this type of mentality very much came when people looked around and said, to move to Austria, nevertheless, if what I'm doing there is better than to stay in Bulgaria. Uh, this kind of the same movement of, uh, uh, of people, a social lift. You have a society in which basically the vertical uh, social lift has disappeared and you believe that basically social promotion goes this way. This creates the paradoxical situation in which people like, uh, for example, Prime Minister Orban, part of his nationalistic rhetoric is an attempt to build the wall, but as I said, not the wall that is going to stop Syrians to come, but stop Hungarians leaving. More people have left Hungary for the last eight years than after 1956 uprising. As a result of it, the labor market in Hungary is changing dramatically. And as a result of it, how you're stopping people going, you're telling them, don't go, for example, to the West, because there is not West anymore. It's a greater Middle East. If you're Hungarian, you're going to leave with all these kind of uh, other people. The real Europe is here because it's only Europeans, it's only Hungarians, and so on. So he wants to restrict the movement of people, but what he's afraid of, and this is interesting, he wants to restrict only the movement of a skilled and highly qualified people. He's interested at the same time, some of the Roma communities and others, to move. So how to balance this and also the <coughs> symbolic politics, the idea that the restriction of movement means that Eastern Europe has lost this is the major story why it doesn't work. And also, I do believe uh, President Macron made a, uh, made a mistake. When he was saying uh, that the drivers, the truck drivers, who are driving through France, they should be paid the minimum wage in France and not the wages that uh, are paying in their own countries, he had a point. But he should frame it like this. I feel ashamed that East Europeans are so badly paid when they're going through France. And he was going to have a support. He said, I'm doing this in order to defend French workers. And then basically, all these companies 
that exploiting these people, they said, oh, this is against us. So from this point of view, this against politics and policy on a policy level, it's quite obvious what could be done in order to rebalance. I do believe the other thing that should be rebalanced is that European Union should compensate particularly money invested in the education of these highly qualified people. Uh, because otherwise, the fact that they're draining your best uh, is creating a level of hostility, you feel as a loser, and I do believe this is, this is, uh, this is, uh, this is wrong. And on the gender and old voters, in Eastern Europe, part of the problem is that some of the old voters are really in a difficult economic situation. And some of them are voting for their interest because simply they have such a low of pensions that they don't have an option, to be honest. They, they don't have the money. This is, not the same, uh, this is not the same kind of a German pensioner or retired person who is going very much to think about their kids. Their kids, first of all, most of them outside of the country, but secondly, the money that they received is not allowing them to function normally. And these people lost also their social status. They lost kind of the value of what they have been doing when their career was mostly during the communist period. Uh, so from this point of view, this is a different story, but the gender issue is becoming critically important also when it comes to the left-right divide. And the most interesting is what is happening of the generation between people of 19 to 35. In Austria, on the third round <coughs> of the presidential elections, more than 63% uh, of the female of this group voted for the Green president, Mr. van der Bellen, while the 54% of the male of the same group voted for the far right, for the candidate of the Freedom Party. So in a certain way, this type of a divide is becoming extremely important. We can see it also in the United States. And this is also connected to two things that I'm going to stop on this. One is the number of girls and women who are getting university education compared with uh, the men of the same generation is changing dramatically and they're doing better for the first time also in the United States the last year. Uh, basically, there were more women of this generation that get of the younger generation who got a college education compared with men. This is a major shift of power, but also because of the change of the economy. In a certain way, the surface economy, of course, privileges the much more mobile and phys not physically dependent worker which is the woman compared with the industrial age where the physical strength, the man who can go and do these things, was quite much more uh, important. So I do believe this is one of the explanations why in some of the countries in Central and Eastern Europe, for example, <coughs> some of the Euroscepticism is in a part of a certain less educated part of the young males. For example, in Poland now, uh, the percentage of the people who are ready to vote for leaving the EU, which is not very popular in Poland anyway, is higher among the generation between 1925 than in any other age group. So the normal idea that the younger the people are, the more pro-European they are, is very much, in my view, challenged by this disbalance between uh, the gender, uh, the gender issue. Yeah. I'm a journalist. Why is it, in the middle of all this misery, that the European project is more popular among its citizens than it's been for 35 years, according to the latest uh, Eurobarometer? And then came the other survey yesterday, I think, about the Euro. That's been increasingly rapidly popular. I think it's a massive majority, two-thirds or something, of the population that say it's a good thing for the country even in places like uh, Italy, where it's been an increase of 12 percentage points over the last 12 months. And, uh, like that, and it's majority for the euro in every member country at the moment. Thank you very much, and I do believe we'll I just have, have an answer. Yeah. Uh, on this, I'll be very, uh, because it's a very important, and I do believe. That. First, w one of the important things that happened is, one of this is the Brexit phenomena. You basically see what is. The alternative to the European Union now is a mess on the other side. Secondly, I, there was no idea to leave the European Union, but why support is going on, you should co correlate also with the questions, do you see positively the rise of some of these populist parties? And you're going to be support, uh, surprised that some of the support for the European Union comes because some people who before have been very skeptical to the European Union started to believe that this new kind of a more Eurosceptical party can change the European Union in the way that fits them more. This is the interesting story. Support for the European Union correlates with the decline criticism towards the 
some of the populist parties which are not perceived anymore as anti-European. <laughs> okay, uh, one question over here. Simeneka. Yeah, I'm Simeneka, I'm a journalist and, and author. I thought your comparison with the 70s was so interesting in the, uh, when you were talking about how Europe managed to integrate the left-wing um, uh, group somehow I isolating uh, Bader Meinhof or, or Brigate Rosse and then moving on. Uh, but is the comparison valid to the right-wing populism uh, today? Are you thinking at, at, at government level, like uh, coalition governments like, like in Austria where you are living now? Or, or is the example of Italy somehow proving that what happens is that the force of the right-wing populism is so much stronger, so it simply somehow eats the conservative uh, uh, parties and, 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 uh, and dominates the political scene completely? Uh, listen, for me, this is an open question. It's uh, because you have different. The interesting story is what with what we compare, and many people are going to compare with the 1930s. And even for the 1930s, one of the major problem was the failure of the European center right, basically, to distinct and to contain uh, uh, the far right in Germany during the Weimar period is a critical example. Austria is an interesting story because the Austrian far right came uh, Freedom Party 20 years ago. So they went through the institutions, basically first local government, regional government. It's not a new party. And this is quite important. Uh, so at the moment, at least, I do believe that uh, uh, Chancellor Kurz is managing uh, to take some of the issues, but basically he's containing uh, uh, part of it. And probably Austria could be said that could be the positive, that can give you an idea that under certain conditions. And don't forget, even during the 1970s, center-left managed to contain part of what then was a far left by including some of the legitimate concerns of these parties. So they were not there simply extreme. They have a very legitimate concerns. What is happening in Italy, and for me this was an interesting story, Italy was a place in which you have two types of a populism clashing. One being born out of the financial crisis, and this is a five-star movement, which was very much, for them, it was not immigration, but it was about economy, and it was about the nature of the elite and so on, clashing. And on the other side, uh, it was an anti-immigrant party. And the funny story is that till yesterday, it was a separatist party, and now it became the national <laughs> unity party. Uh, my fear always was that in the current situation, any time when the anti-immigration populism basically clashed with the anti-capitalist populism, the anti-immigration is going to prevail because the anti-immigration is about symbolic politics. It's much more difficult for the left-wing populist parties, for example, Podemos or Syriza, to deliver. To deliver, because in a certain way, they're much more constrained. Why you can not solve the migration problem, but you can stop a ship and you can talk about it all the time. So you can basically deliver on the level of emotions. So, but on your question, listen, I'm not very optimistic how well uh, the center right is going to do it, uh, but for me this is an important uh, parallel even to try to tell the center right that in a certain way this is their time uh, uh, to, to save the EU. And this has something to do with the previous questions about freedom of movement and others, because we are in a readjustment period. The voters are moving in a different place. The policies, uh, this is why in the book, paradoxically enough, the book is slightly more optimistic than it looks, because my major argument was the following. I was using the Habsburg metaphor. Ever since Napoleon, everybody expected the Habsburg empire to collapse. And they have a very good structural reasons for this. And the last war that they have won was somewhere in the 18th century, and this and that, and this was kind of, but the capacity to survive is a very important source of legitimacy. Any crisis that you survive makes you more legitimate. So <coughs> for the European Union, the very fact that it manages to survive all these crises without necessarily resolving them contributes to its legitimacy. And it also has to do with the question that you asked. Listen, there was the financial crisis, and many said, it's over. But it survived it. Uh, and even with the refugee crisis, people said, that's the end. It was not the end, because people were not so much about people coming. They were very much threatened by the loss of control on the border, the meaning of the borders. So from this point of view, if the European Union managed to adjust to this new situation, which is not going to reinvent its values, and we're not going to be very successful here and there, but if people have the feeling that, for example, when it comes to defense, at least we know what we are talking about, this gives you time, and these times allows you to readjust and basically to change. And also some of these parties, they're 
there were protest parties. Uh, they got out of this anger and so on. Some of them should deliver. It's not so easy to deliver it because the fragmentation in the political public is changing a lot. Yeah. Oh, one more question, I think uh, you're guest. Uh, two small questions. Uh, first, about Poland. Uh, it's an example of an Eastern European country where you see it sort of converges still with Western Europe. The s salaries are increasing at the highest pace, etc. And don't you see this factor contributing as a counterweight to the demographic situation you portray is quite dramatic? And the second question is related to Hungary. Do you see anything the EU should do or could do to counter the political course of Viktor Orban? Uh, both questions again. Listen, for me, Poland is an optimistic story, and I do believe that one of the interesting stories that also can change the perception of Central and Eastern Europe is going to be if the Polish opposition is going to uh, perform well on the European elections. Because Poland is not simply a country that is the best economic performer in the European Union for the last decade. This is a country in which social inequality has declined for the last 10 years. It's not simply gross. This was more social equality. Also, the young generation is the beneficiary of all this. Unlike Hungary, Polish governments in general are clean governments, at least for the East European perspective. Probably for the regions of the Swedes, you're not going to call them clean, but we compare with different things. Th this was not corrupt government. It, neither Tusk was corrupt, nor basically Kaczynski, who otherwise can be blamed for many things, can be accused of this. I'm saying this because people in a certain way, before European, uh, Central Europe was taken for granted for being the, the best students of all and following and so on. Now he's totally written off. It's not true. Uh, well, Poland can come back, and I do believe that in a certain way, Polish come back is going to push many Europeans to understand that they're Eastern Europe in every West European country, but they're also West in every East European country. Hungary is a different story. And I do believe it's very much also the result of a luck and uh, the uh, ambition and the talent of a very specific political leader. Po uh, Hungary got the constitutional majority which allowed Mr. Orban not simply to get everything that he wants, but also makes it very difficult for the European Union to go after him because everything that he was doing was constitutional. Because you can change the constitution if you don't like it. Uh, I do believe that European Union missed the moment in which they could have uh, done something. And part of it is rooted in the fact that when you try to interfere in a certain country, you need a local partner. One of the interesting stories with this type of regimes is why it is so difficult to have a credible opposition in places like Hungary. Uh, because the lack of an interesting and powerful opposition make it difficult for the European Union. Now I don't believe that before the European elections, and I can understand the logic of the EPP not to expel him, because the idea was they didn't want to give a leader to the anti-immigration uh, right. But the problem with Mr. Orban, at least, and I do believe that I'm not wrong on this, I had the feeling that also he developed this hubris. What he did of giving now asylum uh, to the uh, f uh, former Macedonian prime minister, Mr. Grosky, who was basically uh, sentenced uh, for corruption for his own government. It's slightly too much, how to put it. You don't need to do it. And uh, I don't, I can imagine that probably uh, there are problems here and there, but he started to behave as if he's the kingmaker of Europe. It's more complicated. And from this point of view, I do believe that some of the problems that particularly Mr. Orban is going to see is that he can become the victim of his success. Uh, Hungary cannot be the model for Western Europe. And I'm just going to give you two examples. One is the diversity of Western societies. If you're going to use this rhetoric in any of the West European states, simply it's dangerous. You cannot talk about people like this. This is going to have a consequences. And secondly, there is a major difference between West European conservatism and East European conservatism. West European conservatism is post-1968. For example, Jan Spahn in Germany, who is perceived as the leader of the right wing, uh, 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 the right wing of the CDU, he's an openly gay person who basically makes politics with this. Give me an idea how an openly gay person is going to become the vice president of Fidesz. Uh, in a certain way, East European uh, conservatism is a full package. You should be conservative on everything, on ethnicity, on sexuality, on this, on that. And from this point of view, I do believe that 
And also playing President Putin, it makes sense if you're a Russian president. But if you're a president of a small East European countries, playing as if you're a Russian president also can be counterproductive. Uh, and uh, from this point of view, I do believe that uh, uh, I do believe that he played a very important role. Uh, Mr. Orban is a person with incredible political talent on one thing that I do believe that people should be respectful for, uh, uh, people that disagree with. He is a very high risk taker. He positioned himself as the alternative to Chancellor Merkel much earlier when she was in her strengths. He decided to support President Trump in June 2016 when most of the Republican governors were afraid to do it. So he was betting, because imagine if he was going to lose, he knew that nothing good was going to happen for him as a result of it. But as a result of his own successes, you believe that you're going to succeed in everything. And here I see a quite a lot of vulnerability on this side, but I could be wrong for sure. OK, I think we have to end there. Thank you so much for a very interesting no, presentation very and you. discussion. Thank you to the audience for very good questions. So thank you for coming. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.